Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I'm pleased to be here with Minister of Justice Mickey Amory and Minister of Environment and Protected Areas Rebecca Schultz to respond to recent developments in Ottawa's continued attempts to ban plastics. As you may remember, in April 2021, Ottawa unilaterally declared that plastic manufactured items are toxic under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Not only did they ignore reality, but once again, they ignored the law in doing so. Thankfully, last month, the Federal Court of Canada found the government's actions to be unreasonable and unconstitutional. The court recognized that allowing this overreach would enable Ottawa to regulate nearly every aspect of the economy, upsetting the balance of federalism in Canada. It's another useful reminder that the provinces are not subordinate to the central government. The provinces are partners in Confederation, and we ought to be treated as such. This message has really been driven home by the courts this year, here and in the Supreme Court's decision on the Impact Assessment Act. Unfortunately, it's clear from Ottawa's appeal of the federal court's decision that the lesson isn't sinking in, and more reminders are necessary. So Alberta will keep standing up for what's right. And in this case, what's right is the fact that plastics aren't actually toxic. If they were, they wouldn't be in nearly every pro product in the economy. And Alberta can't regulate, or, and Ottawa can't regulate whatever it wants by arbitrarily classifying something as a toxic substance. But we shouldn't be surprised by this, which should come as no surprise to Ottawa that we intend to continue pushing back on their unreasonable and unconstitutional orders. We were interveners in the original case, and we will stay involved throughout the appeals process. The stakes are too high to do anything less. If Ottawa's approach ultimately wins, it will be a disaster for Alberta's and Canada's economy. It would destroy our petrochemicals in, uh, industry, driving away tens of billions of dollars in investment and eliminating tens of thousands of jobs. And it will harm the progress that's occurring in plastics reuse and recycling. Ottawa should listen to these objections. They come from the courts and the constitution and the provinces and the people Ottawa claims to serve. Ottawa would be better served by working with provinces and industry than they are by pushing forward with unconstitutional laws and regulations. We continue to hope for change, but the same old pattern continues to play out. Many federal policy changes on energy and the environment are proving to be the power grabs that we always knew they were. They're rushed efforts to please a few activists and they're focused more on rhetoric than results. They're also undemocratic, unaffordable and unacceptable. All of this applies just as much to the plans for net zero power grids, the carbon tax and emissions as it does to plastics. My promise is that Alberta will fight every step of the way on every issue that affects Albertans. We will continue uh, to uh, put forward uh, facts and precedents before the courts. We will keep on doing this to sustain the prosperity that supports Canadian families and the public services. And we will keep innovating, developing, and coming up with improved solutions to manage plastic waste, reduce emissions, and protect the environment. Albertans have high expectations, and we will meet them. We will deliver the growth and sustainability that Canadians want and need. Minister Amory and Minister Schultz have more details about our response to the plastics ban and federal intrusions into Alberta's jurisdiction and I will turn things over to them. Thank you. Good afternoon. As the Premier mentioned, Alberta will be intervening in the federal government's appeal of the decision holding their designation as plastics as toxics is unreasonable and unconstitutional. When the federal government listed plastic manufactured items as toxic, a number of industry groups challenged this designation in court. To protect our constitutional jurisdiction, the Alberta government intervened in the case and the federal court's decision confirmed that the federal overreach was unconstitutional. Alberta's position is that the federal government far exceeded its constitutional jurisdiction by designating plastics as toxic. The category of plastic manufactured items is so broad that to allow the federal government to regulate them would be to allow the federal government to regulate essentially every single aspect of the modern economy. Imagine the disturbing impact that this federal policy had on every single industry that relies on manufactured plastics. Simply put, this overreach upsets the very balance of federalism in Canada. And that is why we are pleased that the federal court recognized this, but we are disappointed that the federal government chose to appeal. The decision by the federal government to appeal this decision highlights the very issue that we've been raising for decades, that this federal government's overreach is both inappropriate and disrespectful to our system of federalism. 
Because Alberta previously intervened in this matter, Alberta has the right to participate in the appeal and make submissions to the Federal Court of Appeal regarding the constitutional issues at play, and we intend to do exactly that. We will continue to defend our economy and our constitutional jurisdiction against this latest attempt by the federal government to continue to overstep its jurisdiction yet again. Even though the court decided that it was unreasonable and unconstitutional, the designation of plastic manufactured items as toxic remains in effect. This is because the federal government re-added plastic manufactured items to Schedule 1 of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act through a legislative change after the court challenge began. The federal court concluded that this legislative change, namely Bill S-5, was not included in the original court challenge and therefore did not form part of its decision. Alberta will consider its options, including further legal action to remove plastic manufactured items from the current Schedule 1 as it now stands. The federal court's decision that it was unreasonable and unconstitutional to designate plastics as toxic is the latest rebuke of the federal government's unconstitutional, out of touch and ineffective environmental approach. And it follows the Supreme Court of Canada's recent decision that the Impact Assessment Act was largely constitutional as well, unconstitutional as well. It seems that the federal government has not yet learned its lesson. Alberta is prepared once again to make a, the case for a constitutional jurisdiction before the courts. And we will use every single legal, legal avenue available to us to defend our economy and our livelihoods from federal government overreach. I would now like to invite Rebecca Schultz, Minister of Environment and Protected Areas to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much and good afternoon everyone. As the Premier and Minister Amory have said, we will be opposing Ottawa's appeal of the federal court's decision. Let me remind everyone, the federal court's decision was clear. The federal government's plastics regulation and legislation is unconstitutional and completely unreasonable. We will continue to stand up for our province, our constitutional rights, and of course, our economy. Frankly, I'd hoped that we wouldn't have to be here today. The federal court's initial decision was correct, and it was common sense. Drinking straws and grocery bags are not the same as mercury or asbestos. The federal government cannot assume regulatory authority over any substance it chooses simply by designating that substance as toxic. This order was unconstitutional on the day it was written, and we will absolutely win this fight. But let me be clear, this isn't about plastics. Ottawa knows their plastics bans are about virtue signaling and not actually about fixing the problems. They know that this federal designation negatively impacts Alberta's economy, and they know that plastics are important in the economy. That's why they joined us in supporting Dow's new Path to Zero facility in Fort Saskatchewan. Yet, they refuse to listen to the courts and to Canadians. So we will help take them to court, and like I said, we will win. We will do it while continuing to actually reduce plastic waste in our province. Right now, Alberta is implementing a transformative new system that will help reuse plastics and keep them out of landfills. Our extended producer responsibility system will reduce waste, increase demand for recycled content, and transform plastics into value-added products that are reused instead of being dumped into landfills. We've also asked the federal government to support innovations like the compostable 100% non-plastic bags developed by Calgary Co-op and Leaf Environmental Products, but they've refused. They've insisted that only Ottawa knows best and that only Ottawa is right. That is not how Confederation works and it is no way to, to fix the environmental challenges facing our country. So once again, we will push back against this unconstitutional federal overreach. We will ensure that Alberta remains a place of innovation and we will stand up for Albertans while delivering real results that benefit all of our people. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go into the media Q&A portion of the announcement. Uh, we'll start off with questions here in person. If you want to come up to the mic, state your name and outlet, and we'll go with one question and one follow-up. Kevin Green from CTV News. Um, so you, the government was an intervener in the first case where the federal court ruled against the federal government. It's a natural process in law for someone who doesn't like a verdict, if, as long as it's not all the way to the Supreme Court, to appeal the judgment. 
what I've heard from you guys today is nothing but complaining, not what you're going to do. So you're going to be an intervener, you were the last time. What are you going to do rather than complain, which is what you've done for the last 10 minutes? <laughs> well, there is another option. Having lost the Supreme Court decision on the impact assessment uh, statement or the Impact Assessment Act, they could have said, oh, gee, you know, now we've had a second decision that shows that we're wrong. And they could have chosen to rewrite their uh, plastics regulation so that it is compliant with the law. Instead, they do what they always do, is they force us to fight for years in the court to be able to go through all the processes and ultimately get the decision, which I think we will, that is unconstitutional, at which point they'll have to change it. But the, cri the, the uncertainty that they create in the meantime is having a major impact on business. This is why Dow, Petro Dow Chemical and other companies launched the action in the first place. There's a lot of cross-border trade that happens in plastics pro products getting developed here, sent down pelletized, and then sent back here in molded form. And it's creating a lot of additional handling uh, difficulty because they're treating it as if it's some kind of, of, um, of radioactive material. That, that's the problem, is that there's a fundamental fallacy of them trying to assert that this is toxic when it's in our phones, our plastic bottles, the uh, pen I'm using, the binder I had here today. It's absurd for them to be treating this like it is a toxic material. The courts called them out on it and they continue to persist. I have a separate question for the Premier here. Yesterday at the Ring Road press conference when we were there, you said the decision to terminate Dr. Hinshaw's contract was Dr. Cowell's. Today, the ethics commissioner found, and I'll quote, no evidence that Dr. Cowell directed the termination of Dr. Hinshaw's employment. Mm. So if it wasn't Dr. Cowell, if it wasn't you, as you say, if it wasn't Dr. Manns or Dr. Tailfeathers, who actually did terminate Dr. Hinshaw's employment? Well, you can read the letter and you'll see that uh, the ethics co commissioner said it was Alberta Health Services um, and she um, considered the, uh, the evidence and has closed the case. Thanks, Kevin. And we'll go next here. Hi there, Jean-Emmanuel Fortier, Radio-Canada. Just to follow up on, uh, on my colleague, uh, on Dr. Inshaw, would it be acceptable for Dr. Inshaw to have any position in any agency, Crown, public, in Alberta, ever again, in your mind? Look, um, I, we're doing a major transformation of our Alberta healthcare system, and we need the right people in place that have the, the confidence of the public that they can make the changes that are needed to get the system improving. And that's part of the reason why we're doing transformational change. And we're asking many people in management positions who aren't up to the job to, uh, to depart. And we'll be asking many more who aren't up to the job of improving the system to depart. We are the, uh, uh, we, we are the funders of the system. Alberta Health Services gets its mandate from us. They get its money from us. We have an obligation to taxpayers to ensure that it's performing appropriately. And if it's not, we'll make changes. So I would say that uh, we'll have lots of discussions about how we go about doing that. We have a board in place. Ultimately, the board will make the, the decision on personnel. And uh, we're, we're going to be highly involved in making sure that we get the right people in the right place. So just to be clear, is she a person on, on grata in Alberta? Um, look, I've, I've made my, my position very clear. Um, I, when, uh, when I uh, chose a new Chief Medical Officer of Health, I knew we needed new leadership there. So I've got confidence in our new Chief Medical Officer of Health, and we're going to continue making changes in personnel so that we can make the changes in healthcare that we need to. Just a slight uh, technical clarification for Minister Amory about the, the process of the intervenor process. Will we be using uh, the same firms, the same lawyers that you've used successfully in the past? Uh, are you thinking about in-house? Uh, and do you have a sort of specific dollar amount on the cost of the uh, intervening? Right now, we are just commencing and beginning. We don't have an appeal date set at this point in time. We've had tremendous success using both in-house and external counsel. We'll continue to do that. Um, right now, we're preparing, as, as we mentioned, the, we have made our intentions clear. Um, we'll continue to move through the process uh, by employing those that have worked well for us in the past. We've continued to have great success with many firms, uh, including uh, the in-house counsel, and uh, it will be a collaboration between the two. Jonathan Bradley, Western Standard. My question is for Premier Smith. So you spoke about how you've begun consultations and preparing for the appeal. What do you intend on your legal strategy being in this case? We, we have uh, 
have had Dow Chemical and the other uh, petrochemical companies take the lead on this. It's different than when we took the lead on the Impact Assessment Act, and so it had a, a slightly different process. So we continue to watch this go through its various stages, and hopefully um, we'll be able to get the, the kind of outcome that we expect. It's just disappointing that the federal government wouldn't accept defeat and come to the table and work with us on developing a strategy so that we can all achieve what we want. What we all want to achieve is making sure that plastics are not diverted into the river systems and are not diverted into the environment. We want to make sure that we're recycling plastics and putting them to useful purpose. And as the minister mentioned, with uh, our new policies around extended producer liability coming in in the new year, we're going to have a number of different ways that we can use those streams of, of, uh, of, of plastic that are, have been discarded. And I think we'll demonstrate that uh, we're going to be the, the best steward of, of that program. You spoke about the Canadian government not learning its lesson by appealing mm -hmm. the case. Um, do you believe that this case will end up in the Supreme Court of Canada? Why or why not? I, I would anticipate if, if they don't back down, then you know, you'll have to talk to Mickey, Mickey Amory about the, the different steps that it goes through. Um, I mean, I suspect that if, it, if they don't back down, uh, then it will go to the, the highest court. I mean, so there's, as I said, there's different options that you can take. When, when we lost the case on our Public Health Act, we didn't appeal it. We said, oh, we better change our legislation because the court has said that we, we, uh, we weren't in compliance with it. That's an, always an option that's available to a government when they lose a case. They can accept the judgment that they're operating outside their constitutional boundaries and fix the law. And the sooner they do it, the better, because that then creates the, the certainty, and it also restores the constitutional balance. We haven't seen that spirit of cooperative federalism, unfortunately, with this regime, and so we continue to fight it in the courts. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Joe Horwitz, CBC News. Um, we're just wondering, with the amount of people that are moving to Alberta, uh, what's happened to the Alberta is calling signing bonus and the graduation retention tax credit? When might those be introduced? Uh, I think that my minister said she needs a little bit more time on the graduation retention tax credit, so I don't believe that uh, it may need another year before we implement that. But my, my minister, Matt Jones, is responsible for the Alberta's Calling Tax Credit, and he's in the final stages of working what that will look like. I believe it will be announced in the upcoming budget. You'll be able to see the details there. Okay, any, any idea for how many people have applied for those credits or might be getting those bonuses? We haven't put the architecture in place for it just yet. And so um, that'll be the first step, which you'll see in the budget. And then uh, we'll, we'll be able to track that and get some detail for you as, uh, as it rolls out. Great, thanks. thanks. Thank you. And we'll go to the phone lines. Operator, could you put through our first caller, please? Carrie Kate, Globe and Mail. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Premier, I just want to follow up on your answer there to uh, CBC or Radcan. We you talked about um, or trying to find people who have confidence of the public as you go through this major restructuring. Are you saying that Dr. Hinshaw did not have the confidence of Albertans? I'm saying that there's going to be lots of personnel changes that happen at Alberta Health Services, and nobody should be surprised by that as we make sure we've got the right people in the right place to make the right decisions so that we can get the outcomes that we want. And again, to follow up, you didn't answer that, his question the first time. Is Dr. Hinshaw at all, uh, is there a spot for her anywhere in the Alberta health care system? I understand you are making changes. Does she fit in that anywhere, or has she disqualified herself? I believe she has a job you should uh, you should go and see. I think she was hired by the federal government. Thank you, Carrie. And operator, did we have any more callers on the line? There are no other questions in the queue at this time. Thank you. Seeing no more questions, that'll conclude today's announcement. Thank you, everybody, for joining.